Hey guys, what's up? It's Charlie here, and today I'm gonna tell you a story. And the story is of a man who was taken hostage by pirates for 977 days. Before we jump into this absolutely amazing story, why not subscribe and press the notification bell too. If you think your job's hard, get ready to hear about the story of Michael Scott Moore. He doesn't work in paper sales like his namesake in the US TV show The Office. Instead, he's a German-American journalist. When he was working in Berlin, he decided to cover the trial of some Somalian pirates. These Somalian pirates had been taken to justice in Germany. That's after German forces arrested them in 2012. But after the trial was over, he was so interested in Somalian pirates. He realized it's such a big issue and it gets almost no press coverage. So he decided to set sail and explore the world of pirates in Somalia for himself. He took various precautions before traveling there as it is dangerous. He contacted a village elder where he would be staying, and he even organized a security mercenary with a gun to follow him around. In 2012, he arrived in Somalia. Of course, he was going there for work as a journalist, and he was doing it for a newspaper named Spiegel. This is a big German newspaper headquartered in Berlin. He also wanted to write a book about the Somalian pirates who'd just been jailed in Berlin. So he went over to Somalia and went there with an Indian man named Ashwin Rahman. Ashwim is a filmmaker who's done documentaries on Somalia before. He had a good knowledge of the area, but eventually he had to leave. Michael didn't want Ashwin to leave without him, as otherwise he'd be alone in Somalia. But despite this, Ashwin left the Somalian trip early and went back to India. Michael decided to go with Ashwin to the airport and then go back to the hotel alone. He did this because he feared the airport could be dangerous for Ashwin. But the two men weren't too scared, as they'd already arranged security with a Somali elder. This Somali elder was named Mohamed Salah Gerlach. Mohamed had previously guided a German documentary crew in Somalia before Michael's trip. So he assumed he'd be a trustworthy guy and he would keep Michael safe. Mohamed also arranged for a Somali gunman to be riding with Michael at all times. But when Michael was saying goodbye to Ashwin at the airport, somebody came up to him and said something odd. A young Somalian man walked over to him and said, Are you Michael Scott Moore? Michael was confused and concerned and said, Yes. The Somalian man said, You're famous, I know you. But Michael was not famous and he was very suspicious as to how this person knew who he was. Michael instantly knew his cover had been blown and he should get out of Somalia. However, after Ashwin had said goodbye and gone to his flight, Michael drove back to his hotel. However, as he was driving back, a truck with a cannon aimed right at him approached. A few men jumped out of the truck and went over to Michael's car. They then began shooting their guns in the air and opened up his door. Michael tried to hold his car door shut, but they broke his wrist with their rifles. They then pulled him out and took him into their car. And the gunman that Michael was riding with didn't fire a single shot. Maybe he figured he was outnumbered, or maybe he was working with these pirates. Either way, Michael soon realized he'd been taken by the pirates. He was taken to an outdoor camp and led to a foam mattress on the ground. He said he saw very little as he didn't have his glasses on at the time. And during his entire time as a hostage, he never got any glasses. This meant for two and a half years, he was in a state of near blindness. His time with the pirates was terrible. Each day, Michael got some bread, a can of tuna, and some pasta or rice as well as water. But it was hardly a buffet. In fact, he got very little food and he lost 40 pounds within two months. The pirates also told him how they got him. That's right, the village elder was not very trustworthy and his relatives completely turned on him. That's right, the Somalian elder was not trustworthy and his relatives turned out to be no good pirates. One month later, Michael was put into a Land Rover and taken to a new location. He was told at this location he would meet a man named Mohamed Garfanji. Mohamed Garfanji was a pirate kingpin and one of the most dangerous and feared pirates in the world. He eventually got to this secret location and met Mohamed. The pirate kingpin then gave him a phone. On the phone was an American negotiator, and this person was trying to get Michael out of this situation. However, things turned sour when Mohammed Gafanji said he wanted $20 million. He said if the USA gave him $20 million, he would give back Michael. Now, unfortunately, the USA has a policy that they do not negotiate with hostage takers. This meant they'd be giving the pirates no money at all. They also called Michael's mother, but Michael and his family were not rich and did not have anywhere near $20 million. Because of this, Michael spent two and a half years in captivity. Sometimes he was on land with the pirates and sometimes he was at sea. One night he was in a 160 foot tuna boat and tried to escape over the side at night. The boat was not in very good shape and he thought the pirates would not be able to turn around after he jumped off. 
So in the night, Michael jumped off the boat into the water, but he soon realized he'd made a pretty big mistake. The pirates found him very quickly using searchlights, and he had to get back on board the ship. At that point, all he could speak to was his mother, as he forgot the negotiator's phone number. So you're probably wondering, how on earth did Michael not go absolutely insane when he was held captive? Well, apparently he used yoga to calm his mind. He said he would try and do it out of the eyesight of the pirates in case it baffled them. But at some point, they saw him doing it and decided to join in. That's right, Michael literally taught these pirates who kidnapped him yoga. This was a great coping mechanism for Michael when he was captured. But don't think it was all sunshine and rainbows and yoga for Michael. Michael was having some very, very dark thoughts. When Michael was 12, his father took his own life. His father had done this using a pistol. And sadly, when Michael was captured, he considered the same thing. The pirates would often leave around AK-47s. He never used the AK-47 to escape, as he was way outnumbered. But he did sometimes consider using it on himself. However, he knew his friends and family would be so sad, so he decided not to do it. He also did something pretty amazing. He made the decision to forgive his guards. Even though these pirates were taking him hostage, he forgave them. He said it was a daily discipline and daily practice of reminding himself, but it did work. But while he was in Somalia, his mother was putting in a lot of work. Using a cell phone, she'd been talking to the pirates. She had managed to negotiate his $20 million ransom down to $1.6 million. Now, she was not a millionaire, but eventually she did raise the money from other people. Then, one afternoon on a regular day for Michael, a car pulled up outside the compound he was at. A man then leapt out and said, Michael, we're gonna take you to the airport. But at first he did not believe it. However, he was desperate, so he still packed his things and got into the car. But when he got into the car, the man said, Michael, actually we're not going to the airport. Instead, we're going to drive you and give you to some other Somalis. This made Michael very angry as he thought he'd been sold to another gang. But luckily this actually was not the case. Instead, he'd been handed to another Somali who got his mom on the phone. That Somalian man then said, Michael, now we're going to the airport and your pilot is going to be named Derek. Now, obviously, Michael had been held capture for 977 days, so he didn't believe it. But eventually, he did get to the airport and Derek was there in a plane. Someone actually said, can you wait before you take off as a journalist is coming to take your photo? But Michael said, I don't care about that. Derek, get me out of here. And the plane flew off. Luckily, Michael was able to get somewhere safe, and he now lives a normal life as a journalist in America and Germany. Later, he published a book, The Desert and the Sea, 977 Days Captive on the Somalian Pirate Coast. This book went on to be a bestseller, as it's such an amazing story. And he's also now a humanitarian who talks about the dangers of Somalian pirates. Honestly though, I'm amazed he was able to survive 977 days of terrible treatment. But using yoga, meditation, and forgiveness, he did. The richest person to ever live. According to the Forbes real-time list of the richest people in the world, number one is Jeff Bezos. He of course made Amazon, and his net worth is $108.9 billion. Jeff Bezos is 55 years old, but by the time Mansa Musa was that age, his net worth was $400 billion. Mansa Musa was a 14th century West African ruler. Historians say he was richer than anyone could ever describe. But he was also very generous, and that nearly ruined his country's entire economy. Mansa Musa was born in the year 1280. He was the 10th man in a family of rulers in the country Mali. When he was born, his brother was actually ruling the country. But in 1312, he abdicated to go on an expedition around the world. So one day he sailed off with a fleet of 2,000 ships and thousands of men and women. But after they sailed off, they never returned. It's expected that they got lost somewhere in the Atlantic Ocean. This meant that the country of Mali was left to his younger brother, Mansa Musa. As soon as Mansa Musa took over the country, he began expanding its rule. He invaded 24 major cities, and also some other settlements in West Africa that weren't yet countries. But some of the places he invaded include modern-day Senegal, Burkina Faso, Niger, Namibia, Guinea, and the Ivory Coast. And with all of these new lands came a lot of resources and therefore money. Mali soon became Africa's number one producer of gold and salt. And unlike today, when all of that money is tied to a country's central bank, instead it all belonged to him. Mansa Musa had unlimited access to this money and he did very extravagant things. He was very religious, a devout Muslim, and one day he decided to go on a pilgrimage to Mecca. To do this, he'd have to pass through the country of Egypt and the Sahara Desert. 
So he took with him his entire royal court. This included many officials, soldiers, and entertainers. There were also merchants, camel riders, goats and sheep that they used for food, and in total, 60,000 men. Many described it like a giant city moving through a desert. All of the thousands of people in his caravan were draped in gold and Persian silk. They had hundreds of camels, and each one was carrying hundreds of pounds of pure gold. He also lavishly handed out this gold to anyone in Cairo, Egypt, where he stayed for four months. This caused the price of gold to plummet in the region for 10 years, destroying the economy. In fact, Mansa Musa's generosity led to a $1.5 billion economic loss for the Middle East. After Mansa Musa returned back from Mecca, he brought with him a poet. The poet was actually from Andalusia, Spain, and that's because Mansa Musa by now had made a big mark on the world stage. Prior to his gigantic expedition to Mecca, no one on the world stage really knew him. But by now, he was famous worldwide. He paid this Spanish poet $8.2 million. And in exchange, this poet would contribute to the arts, architecture, and literature in Mali. This later led to Mali becoming the center of education for people around the world. Believe it or not, wealthy people would travel all around the world to study in the capital city of Timbuktu. And Mansa Musa is often credited as starting the tradition of education in West Africa. In 1337, Mansa Musa was aged 57. By this time, he had a net worth of well over $400 billion today. But sadly, he passed away that year and his empire was left to his two sons. However, his two sons were nowhere near as good as him and could not hold Mali together. The smaller states which they'd invaded broke off and the Mali Empire crumbled. Also, Europeans came to the region and took much of the empire's land. And that's why Mali is quite a small and poor country today despite it being so big and rich years ago. But nevertheless, it's still amazing to hear the lesser known story of Mansa Musa, the richest man to ever live. British Prime Minister Winston Churchill says, history is written by victors. And that's very true, which is likely why we haven't heard much about Mansa Musa before. So Mansa Musa is four times as rich as the current richest man, Jeff Bezos. But did you know that someone actually came pretty close to matching Mansa Musa's wealth, and he was an American? The richest American to ever live was known as Andrew Carnegie. Andrew Carnegie was a Scottish-American industrialist who nearly had a net worth of $400 billion. He made his fortune in steel, and at a peak, his net worth was $372 billion. But unfortunately for him, he did not break the world record, which remains to be held by Mansa Musa. That's how this man won the lottery 14 times. So first off, who is this mystery man? Chances are you've probably never heard of him before. Well, this man named Stefan Mandel was born in Romania in the 1960s. At that time, Romania was under oppressive communist rule. In the country, there was not many jobs, not much food, and a lot of poverty. Stefan only earned $88 a month, and he had to support his wife and two kids with that. He quickly realized he needed to find a way to get some serious money, and fast. Many of Stefan's friends turned to a life of crime to do this, but he saw another way out. Instead, he looked towards the lottery. All of his friends called him an idiot when he did this. He said he wanted to turn winning the lottery into a business. And to be honest, his friends were not wrong for doubting him. After all, you're more likely to win a gold Olympic medal than win the lottery. You're also more likely to get crushed by a vending machine. And you're four times more likely to get struck by lightning. But Stefan isn't just any old guy, he's a genius mathematician. That's right, he's said to be the first and only man in history to come up with a lottery formula. For years, he spent every minute analyzing theoretical probability. He studied mathematical papers dating back to the 13th century. And after those years of research, he finally wrote a number-picking algorithm. He dubbed this method combinatorial condensation. Using this complex algorithm, he could predict five of the six winning numbers in the lottery every single time. This increased his chances of winning from one in a few million to one in a few thousand. He then took a big risk. He risked his own money by buying large blocks of lottery tickets with the combinations he thought were most likely. But what exactly was his six-step formula? Well, first off, he would calculate the total number of possible combinations. On average, this was around 4 million combinations. He would then find lotteries where the jackpot is 3 or more times the number of possible combinations. For example, if there were 4 million combinations, he would need a 12 million dollar jackpot to make it worth it. He would then try and raise enough cash to pay for each combination. 
He would do this using his own money and also investors. For his biggest lottery win, he actually gathered 2,524 investors. He would then print out millions of tickets with every combination. This actually did used to be legal, but now you'd have to buy the tickets right from the store. He would then deliver those tickets to authorized lottery dealers. And then finally he would win the cash and pay his investors. That's right, he wouldn't get to keep all the money himself as he would have to pay his investors. Not only would he have to pay investors, he'd have to pay taxes too. That's why he did this method 14 times to get a lot of money for himself. Stefan did this all through the late 60s to the early 1980s. And amazingly, he'd move around the world doing this. He began in Romania but quickly went to Australia, the USA and the UK. That's because these countries have the highest lottery winnings. And they also had the strongest currencies, for example the US dollar, the Australian dollar and the pound sterling. But his biggest lottery win was his final one and it was actually the lottery win which changed the lottery as we know it today. Firstly, Stefan set up a fake company named Pacific Financial Resources. He then collected 2,524 investors. Each of them put around $3,000 into this company. He then raised $5 million. He then rented a warehouse in Melbourne, Australia. It was there he set up 30 computers, 12 laser printers and 16 full-time employees. Night and day they would print out 7 million lottery tickets with each different combination. This took 3 months and 1 ton of paper. Then in 1992 he invested that money into the Virginia Lottery. Stefan more or less bought every combination from his investors money. The jackpot was $27 million and he invested $5 million into it. As he expected his method worked yet again and he won the $27 million jackpot. And remember $27 million in the late 90s was much more. In fact it was closer to $35 million at the time. Now although Stefan's method of printing tickets was totally legal at the time because he did pay for it, some disagreed. In fact, the state of Virginia took this as an effort to cheat the system. As a result, for 4 years Stefan was investigated by 14 international crime agencies. This includes the CIA, the FBI, the IRS and the NCA. Eventually though he was paid the jackpot money. And after paying investors, he netted around $2 million for himself. But this was the last time Stefan ever did this, as they changed the rules. As you'll know from today's laws, you can no longer print your own lottery tickets. Instead, you need to go into the store and buy them yourself. This pretty much makes it impossible to buy tickets in such a bulk. Remember, Stefan printed millions of tickets, but no store in the world will have millions of tickets, so there's no way you can do this today. This means that today not even the greatest mathematicians could do Stefan's method. That's because every country in the world changed the lottery's laws to make sure this could never happen again. But you may be asking, where is this rich genius today? Well today Stefan spends his time living in his island home of Vanuatu. This is a tiny island off the coast of Australia. He lives a very quiet life in a beach house on a tropical island as he's now a multi-millionaire. It's amazing that in just a few years he went from living in a poor communist country to being a multi-millionaire. Stefan says he's a man who takes risks in a calculated way. He said he does take risks, but the odds are always in his favour. Why a man lived in an airport for 18 years. So to really understand Moran's story we need to go back to where and when he was born. That is in Iran in 1943. Moran travelled to the United Kingdom in 1973. He did this to study at the University of Bradford. And as a student in the UK he began to protest against the government of Iran. Four years later in 1977 his studies were complete and he returned to Iran. But when he got back to his home country he was not welcomed, in fact he was thrown in jail for his anti-government activities. All of that protesting had caught up to him and he was put in prison. But later on he was exiled from his country completely. This meant he had to leave and he was officially stateless. He did not belong to any country and had no citizenship. He applied to many capitals of Europe. This included Berlin, Germany, Paris, France and London, UK. But he was denied political asylum from Iran by all of these countries. This went on for 4 years until he went to the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. 
Finally, they were able to get Belgium to give him official refugee status in 1981. After spending some years in Belgium, he claimed his mother was British and wanted to travel to the UK and live there. Now that he had this status, he was able to get citizenship in any European country. So in 1986, he packed his bags for the UK. He traveled to London via Paris. But this is where things go seriously wrong for Moran. On the train in Paris, someone stole his briefcase. The briefcase contained all of his refugee documents and his passport. So when he arrived at London's Heathrow Airport, passport control simply sent him back to France. So he had to get on a flight back to France's Charles de Gaulle Airport. When he got to the airport, he was arrested by French police as he had no documents. But his entry into the airport was actually legal, so the police had to release him. However, there was a catch. He could not leave the airport. Legally, he couldn't go into the country of France. But because he legally entered the airport from another country, he was allowed to be there. He was kind of trapped in limbo, legally allowed to be in the airport, but he could not legally leave. If he left the airport and went into France, then he'd instantly be arrested. Police were watching his every move and he'd be thrown in prison. So Moran had no passport, no paperwork, and no country of origin to return to. This meant that Moran had to live in Terminal 1 of France's Charles de Gaulle International Airport. He stayed there for a few days, which became a few weeks, which became a few months, which became a few years. 18 years to be exact. He lived out of his suitcase and he spent most of his time studying and reading about economics. He also chronicled his terrible experience in his diary, which was over a thousand pages long. To survive, he ate at the McDonald's in the food court of the airport. And if you're wondering how he made money, well, he made it from the airport. You see, people would often leave their luggage trolleys lying around at the airport. So the airport began paying flies 50 cent if they put their trolleys back. So what Moran would do is simply gather up a bunch of trolleys and put them back to collect the money. These weren't even his trolleys, they were just random people's and he'd then collect the 50 cent. He also rolled his own Paul Mall cigarettes to pass the time. Eventually Moran became a fixture in the terminal and airport employees bought him newspapers and food every day. Moran was also able to groom himself very well in the men's bathroom and using the money from his trolley scheme he was able to send his clothing to the dry cleaners. Eventually Moran's story was picked up by journalists in France. And this then later spread to the entire world and everyone wanted to interview this man. Journalists from all over the world traveled to the airport to interview him. And of course, he was paid for these interviews which allowed him to make some money. This media buzz led to many sympathetic readers sending him letters. Anyone who read news stories about Moran sent him letters of encouragement. One letter said, we're hopeful that you'll find a safe, comfortable and happy future. And some people who heard about his story in the media also sent him money orders. These money orders would be cashed for him by the airport's chief medical officer, Dr. Philippe Barjon. But eventually all of this media buzz caught the attention of a French human rights lawyer. Christian Bourgeau found out the story and became Moran's lawyer. He thought he could try and persuade Belgium to issue some new refugee documents. But there was a problem. Belgium said they could only issue the documents if Moran presented himself in person. Of course, this was a problem because he needed the documents in order to present himself in person to get the documents. There was no way Moran could get from the airport in Paris to Belgium without being arrested. After all, he had no passport or documentation of who he was. Not only that, Belgium has a law that states any refugee who leaves the country after being accepted cannot return. But finally in 1999, after Christian, the lawyer, worked with the Belgian government, he was able to get Moran some new papers. The Belgian government sent the papers through the mail and the French authorities gave Moran a residence permit. But to his lawyer's astonishment, Moran was not happy with this. He actually said he thought the papers they sent him were fake. He said that in 1981, he was given papers with the name Sir Alfred Moran and a British nationality. But the name on the papers the Belgian government gave him was his original name, Moran Karimi Nasseri. And the nationality listed him as Iranian, which of course he was. His lawyer, who'd spent nearly 10 years trying to help him, was absolutely stunned. And because Moran was not happy, he remained at Terminal 1 of the airport. 
Now, you may think, wouldn't it be more logical for him to simply sign the papers and then legally change his name? Well, you see, the thing is, Moran was not really thinking logically at this point. Surprisingly, living inside an airport for years can make you go a little loopy. And according to Moran's lawyer, that's what happened to him. In 2003, Moran's lawyer, Christian, told GQ that Moran had gone insane. Apparently, at one point, Moran had told his lawyer he was actually Swedish. His lawyer then said, how did you get from Sweden to Iran? And then Moran said, so submarine. Now, of course, this is all mumbo jumbo, but by this time, he'd gone mad. Then in 2006, Moran was hospitalized for an unknown ailment. This ended his long stay at the Charles de Gaulle International Airport in Paris. And instead, he was taken to hospital and then later put up in a hotel near the airport. But he never did get on that flight to London. However, he was given freedom in France. And as of 2008, he was living in a homeless shelter in Paris. In 2004, a movie by Steven Spielberg was made about his life, starring Tom Hanks, called The Terminal. So, while he didn't get to London like he set out to do in 1988, he is now living in France. But other than that, no one's exactly sure what's going on in the life of Moran Kamiri Nasseri right now. But one thing's for sure, it's pretty amazing that he lived in an airport terminal for 18 years.